This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad? It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's the day before the opening of the 2017-2018 NHL regular season and the day after what might be the biggest Flames news of the summer. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, ready to cover it with you. Matt, let's jump right into it. Yermer Yager signs with the Calgary Flames. $1 million for one year, plus a million in bonuses. You called this a while ago. What are your thoughts on this uh, transaction? Well, it's going to be just simply cool to see Yarmir Yager in a Flames jersey. Like, a lot of Flames fans, like when they're growing up as a kid or as a young adult, like Yager was just breaking into the league and was one of the premier players. And a, a lot of fans, myself included, like Yager just because he's such a has always been a very good player and so just the coolness factor of the the flames having him in the organization for a year is awesome to see and on top of it because he's so good as a player it will help all the other young players in the organization to look at this guy who has been one of the top five or six best players in NHL history and they can learn all the little tips and tricks that he does in order to improve their games. I think that's an interesting point too is you know Yager has been in this league since before some of these guys have been born. I mean he won his first cup in 91 which is 26 years ago so Yager's been around you know and winning cups before some of these guys was born. He was drafted the same year as Matthew Kachuk's father and Craig Conroy in 1990. So, you know, Kachuk's seen this player growing up, and he's been his idol, and now he gets to play with him. And that is a really weird thing to have on a team. Yeah, for sure. Like, you look at Gaudreau and Monaghan, like, they've been in the league for a few years now, and they're both weren't even born by the time Yager won a cup. Like, that's nuts. And it's just a really awesome thing to see, and... I think having, like, especially Yager, uh, when he was breaking into the league, he was taught by Kevin Stevens on how to protect the puck. Uh, And I think that with some of our bigger players, guys like Monaghan, even Kachuk, they can see how he does it by, you know, like bending over and using his posterior to create space. And I think that might help each of those players along with a bunch of others on how to control the puck a little better. You're right. He's got a very different style and it's, but he, at the same time, he's been able to adapt to sort of a modern NHL style. He's sort of what I look at as the best of kind of two worlds. He's got that European style to him. He's got a little bit of an older NHL style, but he can still keep up and play with some of the kids. So it's interesting to watch him play for sure. Yeah. And like, he's not the fastest skater, but he is so good with how he thinks the game and how he controls the puck that it really doesn't matter. And because he controls the play so well that it just slows the game down for everybody. And he's able to maneuver and do things effectively. And being a Florida Panthers fan, I've been watching a quite a number of games with him over the last two years, and he's an effective player. And this will probably be one of the most unheralded signings of the offseason for any team in the league. Yager got uh, 46 points last year with Florida. He had 16 goals, 30 assists. Matt, when you and I talked about this earlier in the offseason, we were trying to predict what Yager might command for a contract. And we were thinking, you know, $3 million, $4 million. This is another one of those things where I think we really have to look at Brad, at, uh, at Brad for living and what he's done for this team. And he seems to always be able to get great contracts. Like if someone would have told me Yager's going to sign for one year at $1 million, let's just round off to $2 million if he gets all his bonuses. I would have thought they were nuts. This is a fantastic contract. Oh, for sure. And 
we saw like two years ago Yager scored 60 points and the main difference uh, between two years ago and last year had nothing to do with him uh it, the Panthers were just injured significantly and were missing like all of their best players for a good portion of the season and that's where the point total drops like his overall play like I wouldn't be surprised if he puts up 45 50 points this year again or more it, it it's just that it will take him a little while because you know he hasn't been playing for a while that to build up so like don't expect him to be great in October or early November but once the Yager train gets going he will be fun to watch so Matt realistically where do you see Yager on the in the lineup I know I'm talking to a lot of people who expect him to be the first line right winger I think that on a team that's looking to go deep I'm not sure Yager's the right guy for that yet in a regular role um, I'm thinking this is a depth signing. I can see him on sort of the, you know, if we look at the 3M line as line two, then I can see him on the third line, if you will. Yeah, and I think for the first month, you'll probably see what I think will happen is that Monaghan, Gaudreau, and Ferland play line one, the 3M line as line two, and you allow Yager to get up to speed with Bennett and Versteeg for the first month. And on the power play, you use Yager on the first power play unit just to get familiarity with everybody. Because you can just stick him in front of the net because that's what the Panthers did. And he's good. So he'll bang in goals, no problem. And so then as the season progresses and he gets up to speed, if Furland struggles on the first line, I could see them switching. And that flexibility helps, period. It doesn't, you know, with... Whether you have injuries or otherwise, it just adds another whole dimension to the team. I'm kind of guessing that we're going to see Yager start on the third line. And what I'm predicting is uh, Christopher Stieg on one side, Yager on the other, and Bennett down the middle. And to me, that's a really appealing line. Oh, yeah. It'll be fun. And it's one of those things that, you know, we've talked about Bennett maybe needing to evolve his game a bit. If he can't do that with Versteeg and Yager on his wings, I don't think he's ever going to. No, and we saw that with Alexander Barkov in Florida. Like, he was good, but just good. And once he got put with Yager, his whole game changed as he was able to learn from Yager on all sorts of different aspects of his game, and he's become one of the elite centers in the league. And I could see Yager having that same kind of effect on a whole bunch of players, frankly, on the team, but especially Sam Bennett. And it'll be interesting to see. Like, I know if I was in the role of any of the young players, all I would be doing from now like through this entire season screw the on ice results i'd be watching everything that yager is doing and learning every second of every day just because of the fact that you don't get an opportunity to play with somebody like this very rare you know it because these players never come about rarely so it's a good learning experience and i hope that most of the players take advantage of it because you're dealing with a player that's on a different level of thinking than everybody else by and large and anytime you can steal ways of doing things from somebody that's that good it'll do nothing but benefit your game the question is is they're fighting over who gets to sit next to him on the bus and on the plane and be his roommate well you know you could just have a whole bunch of yager groupies <laughs> the traveling yagers yes now so, all the Flames players just need to grow out the mullets, you know. <laughs> what what I like about this signing, Matt, is it was done after training camp. And the Flames had a spot open. They left it open for the kids. They wanted one of the kids to take the spot. And do you remember in the 60s Batman when something was wrong and they'd, you know, pick up the red phone and call Batman? That's almost what I envision. It's like, okay, none of the kids made it to the Yager phone. And they, they didn't bring Yager in in July or August. They wanted a kid to take that role. And this is, I think, almost plan B in a way. But, you know, I really like that they did offer that to, you know, a guy in his early 20s as opposed to a guy in his mid-40s. So you're calling Brad Living Commissioner Gordon? Yes. Indeed. 
<laughs> and wh- who is the other guy, Chief O'Hara? That could be like Berkey, you know, with the bad hair, who stands next to him when he makes the call. Yeah, sure. Quickly, flash the Yager signal. <laughs> A mullet and comes the, in the clouds. <laughs> you, you, see, you see him running with the mullet, you know, flowing behind him. Well, the to Flames Calgary. logo kind of looks like it, so, you know. I'm waiting for somebody to Photoshop a mullet onto the Flaming Sea. Uh, TSN already did. It's online. You'll have to look it up. So, you know, I mean, to me, I wanted a young guy to take it. I didn't. I was mixed. As a hockey fan, I wanted to see Yager here because it'll be fun to see him here. But as a Flames fan, I wanted a young kid to step up and take the roster spot. So I like that the Flames gave the kids an option first. And you've got to think that there's probably some, almost some beaking going on in Stockton now of, you know what, guys? None of you could get the job done. So the Flames had to call in a guy old enough to be your dad to get the job done. <laughs> yeah, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, uh, like you couldn't beat a 46-year-old player. Like, come on. And... Yeah, it, if that doesn't kick them in the ass, I don't know what will. And, what? you know, they need a uh, good chiding after their preseason. All the players down there. Like, it, save for Jankowski, who got lost in the numbers game. But, you know, everybody else, like, they did not... Like, if they would have played as well as Jankowski did, any of the wingers, Yager wouldn't be on the team right now. But yeah, they didn't. And, and that's that's what I mean. It was their spot to lose. Yeah, and like if Spencer Fu or Hunter Shinkarik or Emil Poirier or Morgan Klimchuk, any of them played anywhere near what Jankowski did, Yager's not a flame. But they didn't. So now the Flames have one of the top right wingers in the NHL, even though he's forty six. So Matt, let me ask you the big question. I know you and I had talked earlier about the new Flames jerseys, and we didn't think there was enough change to warrant buying a new jersey. Are you going to buy a jersey with number 68 on the back? I'll probably wait until, like, everybody who's in, like, the mad rush. But, yeah, I will. Because that's just awesome. Like, I, you know, separating myself, the podcast host, and myself, the Flames fan, like, this is just simply awesome as a fan. And, like, this is one of the players that you grow up watching, like, Iserman and Sackick and Lemieux. Like, it's one of those guys, and they're playing for your team. Like, come on. Like, that's just awesome. Well, I mean, even outside of Calgary, this is a household name. Like, I was talking to my mom today, and she's never really been a hockey fan. You know, she knows the big names. And she called me, she's like, oh, I saw in the news that the Flames signed that Yager guy. He played with Lemieux, didn't he? Like, people know him, even if they're oh, yeah. a huge hockey fan. I've been having people at work tell me, oh, did you hear the Flames signed Yager? Like, everybody knows who this guy is. And I think sometimes we get in our own head of, you know, we know our players, like a Chuck, but really outside of the Calgary market or outside of diehard NHL fans, they're not a huge name, but this is an international name. No, it it's exactly as if, like, the Flames signed Ovechkin or something. Like, you know, age Ovechkin 10, 15 years, but you know what I mean? Like, it's that kind of a name, and come on. Like, that that's just cool and awesome. Like, you know, there's not really any drawbacks other than I don't know. <laughs> like, it, well, and, and let's let's just say, one of the kids goes to Stockton, really shows us something, and gets promoted for a million bucks. You don't feel bad sticking the auger in the press box if we have to. And even then, I don't see foresee that happening. I think Yager is at even if he's ninety percent of what he was last year, he, he is still a high end top nine forward. So, I don't see that happening frankly i haven't checked the all-time numbers list but i have to believe there's the first player to ever wear number 68 here in calgary yes he is i don't even think in training camp we've given that uh, olis matson okay well there you go olis matson's getting bumped yep son find a new number um yeah i mean it's it's a great sign it's going to be fun we have a lot of international listeners to the podcast and you know i've talked to many of them and we have people from various different European countries who are Flames fans. And many of them became Flames fans when Kipper was here, but don't get to see the team. So I'm hoping that for a lot of the fans we have and listeners we have overseas, we're going to be able to let them know a little bit about what Yager's doing and how Yager's doing. So hopefully we can really service some of those international fans with this. 
Yeah, and it'll... I think because Yager is so well liked in general, I think that that will boost Flame's viewership in general just because, hey, cool, you know, it's Yager and he's on a different team and, you know, the Flames are expected to be a good team, so, like, see how he fits in and it'll be interesting there's, to see. There's one of those Spirit of Halloween stores just behind my house. I think I'll walk over on November 1st and ask how many mullet wigs they sold this Halloween. Yeah, that could be a follow-up for one of our future episodes. Do you remember when, uh, what was it, Mike Commodore was here and everyone was wearing the red, like, clown wigs? Yes. Now everyone in Calgary is going to have to get their mullet wig. Well, anything else specifically you want to talk about with number 68 coming here? He's not going to be on the opening day roster, for those wondering. He will not play against Edmonton. Um, I think they're trying to get him here and wouldn't be surprised if he is here for the home opener, but he will not be in the lineup against Edmonton. Yeah, it's a visa issue. It, it's because he hasn't worked in Canada, so it's a diff different set of BS paperwork that has to be worked through, and it's just not quick enough. So he'll miss a game. He might miss the home opener, but he'll be ready thereafter. Matt, you're a you're a Florida Panthers fan. Um, I you might know the story. Maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I remember hearing some sort of a story a couple of years ago in Florida that. They gave him a key to the rink because he always wanted to be there late into the night and early in the morning. Did you ever hear yeah, that story? It, yeah, and uh, he always he likes to skate at night, and so like he usually like he, there's a video somewhere uh, of a thing that he did uh, showing like his training regimen and like his flak jacket that's like weighted and everything to help him just with his overall endurance and he skates every day and plus you got to figure that with guys like Giordano and Frolik who are fitness freaks having someone like Yager especially because he's been able to continue going for so long that they he, those two guys can probably and like anybody over the age of 30 can probably incorporate some of his training regimens into their roster so that way they're doing a little better too there's been a lot of big names that have come through this city i remember there was a lot of fanfare when cujo played here but i haven't heard the kind of fanfare that we've had for yager as long as i can remember like you know we've never really brought in a name and even though yager's slowing down a little bit this is a big signing for the Flames, and I haven't heard this many casual fans so excited about a signing in as long as I can ever remember. Well, you got to figure that in the Flames organization history, the three, four best players to ever play for the, well, five, make it five, were Lanny McDonald, Theo Fleury, Joe Neuendijk, Jerome Ginla, and um, Al McKinnis. Those are the five main guys. Now, none of those guys, despite them all being very good, and in my opinion, all five should be Hall of Famers, they're on, they're just like Hall of Fame level. They're not like all time great level. And the Flames have never had an all time great player play in their organization. And that is something entirely different and of course it, there's going to be a large amount of fanfare just because it, we've never had somebody with that pedigree in the organization at all ever could this be the quickest guy to ever become a forever flame <laughs> if he wins a cup maybe <laughs> we don't retire jersey numbers anymore so we're not going to retire 68 but maybe he'll be a forever flame why not? Especially if we, you know he scores the cup-winning goal. Hey, awesome! You know, you know how you know how some of the old banners had tassels on the bottom. I wonder if we could put long black tassels on the top so it looks like a banner with a mullet. Possible. We'd have to talk to the banner designers. Well, Matt, with that, let's move on to the opening day roster. So the Calgary Flames announced today their 23-man opening day roster. It's pretty much who you expect. Um, in goal, we have Eddie Lack and Mike Smith. On defense, Giordano, Brody, Hamannick, Stone, Hamilton, Bartkowski, and Kulak, who made the team. On the forward side, it's uh, Versteeg, Backland, Goudreau, 
Tanner Glass, Matt Stajan, Kachuk, Lazar, Hathaway, Monahan, Hamilton, Freddie Hamilton, Troy Brower, Michael Froelich, Michael Furland, and Sam Bennett. So looking at that roster going into the season, obviously um, because he's not here yet, Yager's not on that roster. But any th- let's let's start with the defense. Any surprises on defense? None whatsoever. I think that you could have penciled that in the day the season ended and it, you wouldn't have been surprised. Like uh, none of the prospects, like they played well, but not well enough to displace any of the veteran guys. And I think that the Flames still may be looking for a number six in the trade market possibly, but you know, a marginal number six is you know like if that's your biggest problem on defense it's like uh okay sure well especially with the top five that we have yeah it's like okay sure you know like even cup winning teams have crappy number six defensemen so it's not the end of the world if Bartkowski and Kulak struggle in that those spots I liked Rasmus Anderson in that role in the preseason, but I think he's going to develop better playing top pairing minutes in the AHL than he will play number six minutes in the NHL. So I think that Kulak was the natural fit there. I heard some people say Watherspoon, but you know, I don't know. This organization seems done with Watherspoon. I'm surprised they even re-signed him, but I don't see Watherspoon getting a shot at a full-time shot at Calgary Flames roster spot. They've just jerked him around too much the last couple of years. Yeah. And they just needed veteran depth and stuff. Yeah, just veteran depth. I mean, they've called the kid up and not even played him a few times. Yeah, well, he's not that mind-blowingly good where he deserved an opportunity. Like, he, you know, it's partially on the flames for jerking him around, but it's also on the player for not doing enough when he gets an opportunity. You, and we talked about this in the past, uh, you had an interesting thought on Bartkowski. Do you want to share that again of why you think that they've left him on the team as number seven? Because of his veteran presence and that you can just stick him in the press box and worst case scenario, if somebody gets banged up a little bit but can go in a couple games, you can just stick him in and there's not a problem. If somebody First time a guy goes down with an injury, I think they make a call to Stockton and bring Raz up. Yeah. Or, or there for the back to back, and we need somebody quick. Yeah, or say Shillington, depending on you know, because we all know Gullitson likes his left rights. That's true. Yeah, I just think that I don't know. Shillington got sent down early. I think Raz is probably the next guy on the list. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Barkowski is number seven. Who's probably I think he'd be lucky to play twelve games this year. I have no problem with. I think it's better again keeping a veteran guy there than it is you know putting a kid in and trying to shuffle the him and Kulak around depth is never a problem especially in the playoffs because you know you always have players banged up and you, you just need some times for players just to be able to play if eat a few minutes and just lean on your other guys yeah and I mean Bartkowski is serviceable enough that if you, we say you know hey somebody's under the weather or not feeling well Bart can go in and play one game maybe two games you know a second game on a back to back we don't want him playing you know a 3 4 game stretch if we can avoid it and I think that's where the the depth that we see in Stockton is going to help us but I have no problem with him stepping in you know in a, in six line minutes where he might be playing 8 minutes a night for one or two games Yeah and he'll be sheltered. It's not like he's getting special team time either. So, well, and Doesn't he's playing matter. with Stone. I mean, there's you know, there's only so much trouble you can get into playing with Michael Stone. Yeah. Well, let's move to the forward list here: um, Versteeg, Backlund, Goudreau, Glass, Stajan, Kachuk, Lazar, Hathaway, Monahan, Hamilton, Brower, Froelich, Furlan, Bennett. Let's start with the obvious. Um, Name there that we weren't expecting coming the offseason, number 15, Tanner Glass. He was wearing 51 during training camp and took uh, 15 for the season. He got signed today to a $650,000 deal one way, which I believe is now league minimum, isn't it? Yes. So Glass is in the organization. He plays a similar role to Gadzik, I think, who's now in the AHL, but he's that rough-and-tumble guy who I think can play better hockey than Gadzik. My guess here, Matt, Tanner Glass is simply holding a roster spot until uh, Yermer Yager arrives. I don't think he, we're going to see him 
in the Flames lineup after that. What do you think? I disagree with you there. I think Tanner Glass is that useful 12th slash 13th forward that like if you're playing a team that has some toughness to it, you stick Glass in. And it's just to throw other players off, be a little bit of a disturber, and he's not going to hurt you that much. Like he's not a very good player, but for all the other things that he brings, it's a valuable thing. And I think that he played well enough where he'll be in and out of the lineup for most of the season on the fourth line. So as soon as um, Yager arrives, we will have 15 forwards. Somebody has to get sent down. Do you think it'll be Hathaway then that gets sent to the farm? Yeah, Hathaway was waived, so they have 30 days or 10 games to reassign him. So I would assume that... Yeah, like, I think it's 10 games or th- or 30 calendar days. Yeah, so I'd assume that Yager, once he arrives, Hathaway goes down. And, you know, I understand what you're saying about Glass. I can understand where you're coming from. I think... It was especially obvious in the playoff series against the Ducks that we need a bit more muscle. And I think that's why they've got Glass. That's why they've got Gadzik. I mean, I can see when the roster limits are lifted for the playoffs, both those guys being recalled. Um, you do need you do need a bit of a bruiser. And we even saw some teams taking some liberties last year with Goudreau. And I think having Glass, even if he's in the press box, okay, this team is taking some liberties with our guys. Next game, let's, let's put Glass yeah, out there. Yeah, and it... Just, it's a deterrent. And especially in the playoffs, looking at our division, the the three teams besides Calgary that are likely to get there are Los Angeles, Edmonton, and Anaheim. All three of those teams have physical type forwards like Tanner Glass. And you need some sort of countermeasure against that. And... Yeah, a lot of people probably are like, oh, why did we waste the contract on glass? But there is uh, still a need for players like that. And glass, to his credit, played well in the preseason, so he deserved the contract. Yeah, he did play well, and that's the thing. He earned that contract. And, you know, if they decide they don't want him, I mean, they can easily send him down. It's a one-year deal. I think that it it doesn't hurt to have that muscle player. If you look at the extra forwards on this team, it's going to be him and Freddie Hamilton. I think Hamilton has a place, but I think that Glass is serviceable enough, sort of like Bartkowski, for one or two games, he's serviceable enough you can stick him in the lineup if we need him. Yeah, like it's not like you're going to play him against like some finesse team like, say, Vancouver. You're not going to play Glass then it, because it's just not necessary. But a team like... Anaheim it is and it's an insurance policy yeah and it's like if you're gonna screw around we got somebody that can screw around too and it it's still part of the game and it's a good option to have and we'll see Uh, I don't see it him playing more than 30 or 40 games mind you but he's still a valuable piece in the puzzle and good for Tanner Glass. I mean, he's a 33-year-old. He's come to camp as a part-time tryout guy. I think when I first heard that Glass was coming to camp, I didn't expect he'd get a contract. I thought, okay, no, I just... thought he was just filling the veteran quotient for, you know, we need to get the minimum number of veterans for, like, the early preseason games, and then that's it. And so, you know, he really, I think of all the guys, even in Stockton, he was the one that stood out to me f- at the preseason of, wow, this guy's actually doing something. And I think Glass probably realized he's fighting for his job. So good for him. He answered the bell, so to say, you know, being the fighter, the tough guy. And, um, you know, he battled his way onto the roster. So you can't fault Tanner Glass for that. The Flames, I think, had no choice but to sign this guy. Yeah, he played well enough that he took a spot. And, that's and you know, what... it's, a, it's a one-year deal. I mean, you know, yeah, oh, no. it's yeah, not it's like, like we with have contracts and he's going to be the last guy. I don't think he'll be back next year, but for one year, it can't hurt. Yeah, exactly. It's like with Yager. Okay, it helps temporarily while you try to figure out a more permanent solution. So what's the problem? I wouldn't be surprised if we see Tanner waived at some point just for flexibility down the road. But yeah. I don't see him going down to Stockton for any length of time. I mean, they've got Gadzik down there. Um, you know, you don't need you don't need the Bruise Brothers. 
So, Matt, looking at the forward lineup then, we've got 14 forwards once Yager arrives. We both assume that Hathaway is on his way out. Um, generally, teams like to carry 13 or 14. We can do that, definitely. But one name that's noticeably missing from this list who people thought should be in there and you know, arguably should have been that 15th forward is Mark Jankowski. He was probably the only young guy who came to camp looking like he was ready for the NHL, and he got sent back to the AHL today. Uh, didn't have to clear waivers. He's too young for that. What are your? I know you shared some thoughts with me before the show that I think are pretty valid. I'm actually pleased for this move, and anybody who's listened to me or read my stuff on Calgary Puck knows I'm a huge Jankowski fan. And on about... 30 other teams in the league. Jankowski is in either the second or third line center on October 4th. But Calgary is an unusual team where we have so much depth that it, Jankowski would have been playing on the fourth line. And is it better to have him playing eight minutes a night with Tanner Glass and Curtis Lazar and other so so players? Brower. I'm not going to count him as a so-so player. But no, but he's probably going to be on the fourth line this year. Yeah, and or going into Stockton and being the guy there. Realistically, any other team, Jankowski's on the opening day roster. It's just that Calgary's so deep that he's not. it's not in his best interest to start the season in terms of a de- developmental thing. And... If he tears the cover off the puck in the the A to start the year, like he'll be back up in a couple of weeks. Like especially if there's any injuries, period, to any forward, Jankowski's getting recalled. It's just what's better for him, and for now, it's better that he gets twenty minutes a night and is the guy playing in all situations than playing limited minutes in a mostly defensive minded role and where he's not really able to flex his offensive skill like that might actually stagnate his development so it's frustrating because he did play his way onto the team it's just a numbers game and unfortunately the flames are too good which is a bad problem to have you know we're just too good that we can't accept this six foot five top six center into our team well as you mentioned i mean if you look down the middle and you know centers are where this team struggled for a number of years but also where a lot of teams struggle you know we have monahan backland bennett jankowski would be stuck in a fourth line role and i totally agree with you i think he's definitely the first call up i don't think it matters what position we'll move other guys around yeah because you could just in. throw bennett anywhere yeah i mean lazar can play both wings there's a lot of options there but and i think it might also in a way be a motivation tactic for a guy like say stajan where they might say you know what we've got this kid who's ready to make the team show us that you need to stay in the lineup yeah true enough and same goes with all of the depth forwards you know show that you're better than the kid that's chomping at the bit in stockton but I agree with you. I would rather have him play. I mean, he's only had one season in the AHL. It's not as though there's a guy who's played in the AHL for, you know, three, four years. And it's like, okay, he's got nothing else to learn there. He's only had a f- one full season in the AHL. So I think part of a second season isn't going to hurt his development at all. He'll play, like you said, 20 minute. Sh- he'll play 20 minutes a night. He'll be the guy. He'll put up a lot of points. And if nothing else, that'll keep the morale up. You know, this guy's scoring a ton down there instead of, oh, I'm on the fourth line. I'm getting banged up because that's the role I'm in. And I think he'd much rather be in that scoring role. Yeah. And especially as the team moves forward into the following seasons, the post Yager era, we're going to need players to fit. And guys like Versteeg and Yager are not necessarily going to be on the team next year. And having good valuable replacement options helps well and i mean it also gives us that 
momentum down the road that if we do need to make a deal, we know that we have a piece that we're comfortable slotting in there. And I think that might be one of the things the GM wants is, okay, now I know what I've got ready for me if I deal a forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I mean, as fans, we would love to hear Beasley announce number 77 at the home opener when we get to see the players, but Matt's right for development. I think this is the right thing for Janko and he'll be back. I mean, I would be surprised if he's not here by Christmas, they're going to find a way to get this guy into the lineup. He's ready. It's just that right now, you know, in the first week of October, it's not the right time. No. And if we weren't as deep as we are, he'd be here, but we're too good. Bad problem to have, you know, <laughs> yeah, and you know, he, when he does come up, they want to give him the opportunity to succeed, not just a roster spot. Yeah. So, Matt, looking at the forward roster then and talking about, you know, potentially making moves, doesn't it feel to you like there's some sort of move that's right around the corner here? I mean, we've got too many forwards. Um, I think that, you know, we've got maybe too many centermen. I've said this since the beginning of the year, but just. It feels like there's another shoe to drop. There's too many guys on the roster right now, and I don't think you can play the whole year with this lineup. It just, I don't know, I just get this weird feeling that something's going to happen in the next week here. What I would look to is a Troy Brower for a number six defenseman move. You're going to have to eat some of that salary. Possibly. I don't think there's a team that's looking to bring in Brower right now. What, four point five million? Yeah, you might be able to. It depends on who you're getting. In Find return. a team who lost the Yager sweepstakes and say there's your consolation prize. Yeah, and you know I could see them because Brower is too good realistically to be a fourth line player. Like he was still the forty point player for most of the season last year. It's just that the injury and then the subsequent recovery time from said injury is what really plummeted his numbers for a while. But so let's talk about that for a bit. So I mean, you know, Flames fans have been crapping on Brower for a year now. He was brought in here to be the number one right winger. That was the hope. You can tell that by the comments that were made when he was signed, by the salary they gave him, and. Did he have a great season last year? No, but he broke his hand, what, about Christmas? Yeah, early in December, I think. And it those type of injuries take a while, not just to heal enough that you can play, but just to get the feeling properly back in the hand so that way you can do what you're supposed to do. And, like, Brower's been a very consistent player throughout his career in that 40-point-ish role. It's just that, unfortunately, he had a tough year because of the injury and the recovery time from it. And if you subtract that portion, he played as Troy Brower usually does. He still had so, 25 points for the Flames last year. Yeah, like it, it's not that big of a deal. And I think what people are looking at is for his money, yeah, he underperformed, but he was hurt. And... This is a player I've been saying to people, let's give him another year to see what he can do now that he's probably healthy. Yeah, and like I, I personally don't want to see him stuck on the fourth line because that's not really fair to him either. And But at the same time, where else do you put him, Matt? I know, that's the tough thing. And Is he ready to be the first line right? Well, it really depends. Like If Ferland struggles, then maybe you move Yager up to line one and you put Brower on the third line. But but even then, he's still, bo- I mean, third line, fourth line, he's still playing that bottom six role. I know. It's tough. That's why I could see a feasible trade where the Flames get a different player in, uh, like it, likely a defenseman, maybe on a one- or two-year deal instead of three years remaining. See, the issue to me there is you're still then bringing in a roster player, which I don't think we need. I'm thinking if I'm the GM... I'm going to try and move Brower for any sort of a draft pick, especially because we're short some next year. I think anything you can recover for the draft would be, uh, to me, ideal. I think that, you know, we're okay with Kulak where we are. I don't see a need to upgrade that position. Yeah. Well, uh, I look at Las Vegas, and they have like eight or nine defensemen right now. So I think they've got 11 defensemen last I looked. 
Yeah, like just some absurd number, and their forward group's kind of mediocre. Plus, McPhee did trade for Brower, so... You think you there, get him to trade for him again? There's a possible fit there, and we'll see. Any specific defenseman you like out of Vegas? It would be amusing for to get Clayton Stoner just because the third one, their third pairing would be Stone and Stoner, but <laughs> sounds like a bad law firm, doesn't it? Yeah. Stone and Stoner, you're a defensive specialist. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, Vegas's defense kind of sucks by and large. Well, not I, to be, I, I, I think know, that unexpected. I didn't think any expansion team does. Yeah, like even if it ended up being that we'd have to take Sabiza, I'd be fine with that. Do you take England back? No. I know you're as an England fan. I wouldn't take him back. No. You know, I, I could see them doing Sabiza. I could see the Flames trying to do a package for Griffin Reinhardt. But, yeah, I don't know. I think Vegas is a likely... If if you're looking to get a roster player back, Vegas for sure is a likely player. Even Braden McNabb wouldn't be too bad. Yeah. Um, I, yeah wouldn't, the, I wouldn't be opposed to defense. adding a bit for McNabb, actually. Yeah, I don't know. Again, looking at this roster, I don't know what else we'd add. Who knows? But, you know, I, I think you're right. If you're If you're looking for a defenseman on the roster, I think that Vegas is a team that could both afford the salary and would probably be willing to move a defenseman. So that makes sense. I would be looking to get futures back. And I think that even if we swallow, let's say, let's just call it worst case scenario. The Flames swallow half of the salary. Well, we were planning to pay the full salary this year anyways. And swallowing half the salary for the duration of the contract is better than buying them out and having a cap hit for double the length of the contract, which I think would be eight years. Yeah. So, uh, no, it'd be six. It's how many years remaining. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then the other thing to remember, too, is that Brower does have a full no trade. So we can't move him without his consent. There's been some talk online that there might be a Brower trade in the works, and that might be the thing that the Flames are waiting for, is to get consent to move him. Because I can't see Troy wanting to be a fourth-line guy either. No, because you got to look at him. Like If he's stuck on the fourth line then he's going to be probably getting 15, 20 points this year. And then next year, oh, well, he's just going to be stuck on the fourth line again and then likely bought out the final year. Well, then is he going to ever get another NHL contract? Likely not. So, you know, I'm sure that he'd like to continue his NHL career beyond three years from now. And being on the fourth line is not the best venue to do so. And I'm, I'm just looking here. At, you know, I guess I'm looking for him. What's the best case scenario? He gets moved up to the third line. Like I can't see, I can't see him being on the first line for any length of time. No injuries see, have to happen for that to happen. I can't see them breaking up the three M line to put him on there. So your best case scenario is you're playing third line, which isn't that many more minutes. And I think even then you're lucky to get 28 points from this guy. Yeah, and it's just not fair to him. So. It's one of those things that, like, if the Flames keep Brower all year and into the playoffs, awesome. You know, is he is a good player. It, I'm not crapping on him. Like, he's good. It, like, he's one of the best fourth line players in the league. Probably the best fourth line player in the league. It's just that's not necessarily fair or the best use of him as an asset to have him there. Yeah, I think that there there's more value in moving him and more value to him to be moved than to be stuck on the fourth line. I agree with you. And there was talk that one of the other teams that was in on the Yager sweepstakes was Brower's former team, the St. Louis Blues. So I could also see the Flames calling them up and saying, look, you guys obviously need a forward. There's a forward you're very familiar with, and we know the teams like to dance with the devil they know instead of the devil they don't a lot of times. So maybe there's some potential in St. Louis as well. Yeah. The tough thing with St. Louis is that they don't have anybody that's a high enough contract coming like that's expendable. So. Well, that's it. With St. Louis, we'd probably have to take, you know, 2 million, 3 million back in junk. And if we're trying to get rid of a player on the roster, you don't want to get rid of one to bring another one in. Yeah. 
to me, this is a move that it's addition by subtraction because now we have a rough spot to bring somebody like Jankowski up or to you know, bring somebody like Hathaway up. We don't want to take back a contract in this unless, like you said, it's maybe a defenseman. But even then, I mean, every, I don't know, every team needs a bad contract. And I don't think the Brower contract is going to be all that bad this year. Yeah, he's been overpaid. I think this guy can contribute to the team. But I I know where you're going with bringing in a different defenseman. I think for me, I'd just rather flip him for draft picks if I could do it. Yeah, we'll see. Even a fourth. Like, I have faith that True Living. True Living seems to be a trading wizard. and Someone needs to get this guy a hat, like a wizard hat. But um, True Living seems to always be able to make something out of assets we didn't expect him to. So I could see bringing in, like, a fourth-round pick and him then being able to parlay that and something else into a higher pick. Here's a crazy idea for you, Matt. And I was thinking this when the Flames were were making their moves um, and waving guys. I honestly expected that we might see Stajan waved. I think that Stajan, if Jankowski does make this team, Stajan becomes a left winger, but we've got enough wingers as it is. I can see there being value in the last year of his contract to sending Stajan to Stockton putting a C on him there and making him the, um, you know, sort of the face of that team, the veteran face for a year. I don't know what Stajan's going to get us as a, you know, rental player at the deadline. I don't think there's a lot of value there. So I'm thinking maybe the best option here is send Stajan down, bring Janko up and, or leave Janko down there. But I'm just, I'm thinking that Stajan might be best now in Stockton. I think that having Stajan as the fourth line center is a good thing just because of the fact that you can never have enough depth. And especially when it comes time for the playoffs, like he's. You know, he's calling back up. Yeah, but I think that teams might actually claim him. So I'd rather just leave him on the roster. He plays a good fourth line, he's a good penalty killer. Uh, there's no harm in keeping him. It's not like we need the cap space. So. Well, and again, it might be a motivating factor to him that they might say, look, Janko's right there. You know, if you can't do this, we're going to bring Janko up to do it and you'll sit in the press box. Yeah, and that is a thing too. And if Janko plays so well in Stockton that they need to make room, they could also, and if Stajan's playing well, they could always move Stajan to the wing as well. So we'll see. It, there's lots of options. I just think that one of the one of the reasons that we've said for years to keep staging on the team and even last year keep Brown on the team is that veteran presence. But, I mean, we're bringing in a guy who probably has as much NHL experience as both of them combined. So even by subtracting one or maybe both of them, we're still going to have veteran presence between Glass, between Yager. Yeah. It, the thing is, I don't care about the early part of the season. I It, it really doesn't matter. The Flames are good enough where they're going to be a playoff team. I care about March, April, May, June. And having the, that's the reason why at the trade deadline teams acquire miscellaneous veterans all over the place. I can see there being somebody who will pay us more than Stajan's worth at the deadline. And I don't see the need to trade Stajan either. I think that just having all of these players in the organization helps for when the playoffs happen because of the fact that we have so much depth that because injuries occur it, every team gets bit somehow and you look at Pittsburgh last year they were missing three or four guys throughout their postseason run and they still managed to win the cup but they had the quality secondary people and that if the Flames shed a bunch of these secondary players then if injuries happen when injuries happen, then you're relying on guys like Hunter and Carrick to play, and I'd rather have options. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's one of those things that it depth having depth is not a bad thing, and just run with it. I know where you're coming from, and I understand. You know, yeah, having staging rounds good, but I think that question also becomes: How does the Stockton depth look? If we've got, let's say, a guy like Emil Poirier pulls up his socks and looks like a Jankowski, we might say, you know, we've got enough depth to get us through the playoffs in a depth role, and maybe there is more value in moving a veteran down the line. If any of the kids play well enough, room will be made. But until then, 
it, it's one of those things that you need the players to force the hand. And we saw in the preseason that n other than Jankowski, nobody forced the hand. So if players step up, then maybe. But they'd be having having to have, like, Poirier would need to put up 50 points by the trade deadline to make sense to move somebody else. And do I think he has that in him? Possibly, but I doubt it. And that's... It's weird to be sitting here talking about a problem we have when we've got a guy like Troy Brower on a fourth line. Like, there's a oh, lot I know. of teams that would love to have Brower on their fourth line. And here we are saying, you know what, maybe we should move this guy. I know. We have a lot of depth. We're a good team. It's like, of all shocking. problems to have, we've got the best possible well, that, problem. Well, that, that's also part of the problem. Calgary hasn't had a team like this since, like, 1990. So, we're all kind of unfamiliar. Like, we have a legitimate top six forward in Troy Brower, or top nine forward in Troy Brower on the fourth line. That's that's just not anything to do with Calgary. You know, like that, you're looking at teams like Chicago when they were winning the cup or Boston when they were winning the cup for teams that were that deep. And like, it's just unfamiliar territory entirely. And it's a good thing, you know, cause that means that the flames have enough depth where they are actual cup contender. It's just feels weird. <laughs> It's it does, and it's it's interesting. I mean, every team needs a scapegoat, and Brower's become our scapegoat here. But I think we're going to see a different season from him this year. I'm hoping that he, for his sake and for the team, I hope he has a good year. Well, Matt, why don't we shift gears a little bit and let's uh, take out our hockey crystal balls and make some predictions for the coming season, considering it starts tomorrow. But before we do that, this is our time to beat each other up. Let's go back and look at our predictions from last year, shall we? Sure thing. Last year, you and I both predicted the same player would be the first player moved out of Calgary in 2017. We predicted it was Lance Boma. And in fact, he was the last player moved out of Calgary in 2017 when he got bought out uh, just before July 1st. Oh, so we he were moved, right. just not as it, fast yeah. as we expected. Then you and I also predicted the expansion draft in who we thought would get taken by Vegas. You thought it would either be Brower or Stajan. I thought it would be Stajan or Furland. To me, Vegas made the stupidest move they could make because they could have had England for free a week later, but they took Derek England. Well, Vegas did some weird things. I think what they're trying to do is suck as bad as possible to get high quality. Take the Edmonton model. Suck until you get a McDavid. And See, I think what they were doing is they were trying to pick up pieces they thought they could trade and there wasn't the market they thought they'd have for them. Yeah. Though I do think James uh, James Neal may be the most sought-after free agent at uh, at the deadline this year. Definitely. Pending, Duchesne's already been traded. Um, we predicted where we think the Flames would finish from the bottom of the league. You thought they'd finish 10th from the bottom. I thought 9th from the bottom. Or, sorry, from the Western Conference. No, the league. So, did better than we expected. Well, um, didn't I say that we were going to be a playoff team last year and you didn't? I thought we might barely squeak in, but I didn't. Yeah, I didn't think we'd make it. Yeah, I think we were on I either side of that times. coin. Yeah, I think we were on either side of the that line. And the Flames were just on the good side of that line, so... We talked last year about who we thought would get more starts between the co the combination of Elliot and and Johnson, and we both said Elliot would get more starts in 2017. And the next one is one that I have to sort of be shamed that we both got wrong. We both predicted Edmonton would not make the postseason. Yeah, well, come on. <laughs> and now there's talk of them winning the cup this year. And yeah, I you know you'd have to look at every cup winner. And they have third and fourth lines that actually can contribute in they a also positive six manner. Defensemen. Yeah, and you look at Edmonton; they have McDavid, they have Drysital, and nothing else. And a new arena. Yeah, that too. Like it doesn't those, have enough Those bathrooms. pieces are good enough where they should be in the playoffs, or 
in that vicinity. But in order to win, like one guy, unless you're Patrick Waugh in 93, one guy can't win a cup. And McDavid, as good as he is, he's not that good. I also, and I've said this to you last year and this year, I worry that their goaltender, when he gets hurt, the whole team just goes down the drain. Like, Laurent Brassois cannot carry more than Oh, no. Games. If Talbot regresses even slightly, the Oilers are screwed. Like, if, he, it, if he gets hurt for any length of time, they're done. Yeah. And there's oh, no sure. UFA goalie you can call in as backup. No. Like, the Oilers are... Like, if any of Dreisaitl, McDavid, or Talbot get hurt or regress at all, they're done. They're screwed. They don't I have can, anything. I can see if Talbot gets hurt... Them trying to make a desperate move with Calgary to get lack just for something. Yeah, well, insert any team that has any backup that's actually viable as a well, starter. That's it. Yeah, like I think they'll be, and they'll have to overpay because everyone knows oh, they're going to be desperate. Yeah, and I think a lot of teams resent Edmonton for getting McDavid in the first place, so they're not going to be bending backwards to help out. Call Vegas and get Flurry. Yeah, I don't see that as being an upgrade, but anyway. Well, it's it's better. You you don't see him as being an upgrade over Brassois. Mm. Yeah, he is, but he's he's definitely he's not an upgrade over Talbot. I know you don't like the guy, but you go, you can't tell me he's he's not as good as Brassois. Oh, for sure, he is. It's I just... mean, if you just need a guy to get you to the playoffs, he'll yeah. do that this year. Yeah, true enough. Right, he's not going to win you a cup, but he'll get you the postseason. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know. I that's my most likely scenario for them as a plan B is pay Vegas off to get uh, to get them, pay whatever it's going to take because they're probably willing to part with them. They're not going to be a playoff team in Vegas. No. All right, well, Matt, you got your crystal ball out, ready to look ahead. Sure. Who do you think? To, who do you expect to have a breakout season in 2017, 2018 for the Flames? I'm going to put a caveat. Neither one of us can say Sam Bennett because that's just too obvious. Um. I'm going to have to say TJ Brody. Why is that? Having Travis Hamnick with him. I think that he succeeded well with Giordano, but being in a slightly less role where he's not needed to be the guy in Calgary and having somebody who's legitimately good, it'll allow him the flexibility to do better overall and i think he'll have his best season of his career i'm gonna go along a similar line i think that this is gonna be the year that dougie hamilton really shows that he's a premier defenseman he got 50 points last year i didn't realize that i was taking him in my hockey pool and realized that um i think that he's found the right partner in geo and i think this is the year that dougie really breaks out i mean last year it was sort of the okay let's put him there because he's the next best guy after Brody, but I think this is the year he really jumps into a number two spot. On a secondary level, I'm also going to say Curtis Lazar. I think Lazar isn't going to have a year that's going to, I don't want to say matter much for the Flames, but he's still going to be a third, fourth line guy. But I think he's going to break out of that, you know, first first round pick slump that he's in and show that he's, a, I think, a legitimate roster player. I kind of see him trending into being like a Curtis Glenn Cross amalgam type player moving forward yeah you could be right i think a younger version of that for sure yeah all right on the flip side matt who do you think might we might see a lot of struggles from this season yeah i'm gonna have to go with michael furland just because of the expectations of him being a legitimate first line forward even though i don't think he is and that's not to i'm not saying that he's going to have a bad season i just I think the expectations of him are too high for the type of player he is. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I mean, this guy's expect to start on the first line. I don't think he's a first line guy. I really don't. I think that he's he's a good second, third line guy, but it's just that because of the I think flames. he's more bottom nine than a middle six. Yeah, I think we're gonna see Kulak struggle to hold a legitimate number six spot, and I think that we might see some regression from Michael Backlund. I can see that. I think Backlund looked good last year with the right partners. I think that he might, and also in a contract year, I I just don't see him necessarily being as effective as he might have been 
last year. I don't think he's going to be bad, but I can see Bennett sort of jumping above him to that number two center spot. Yeah, I can see that. Next question for you. We have two goaltenders this year who a lot of people expect to see a lot of, Mike Smith and Eddie Lack. Um, how do you expect the goaltending to be broken up this year between the two of them? 55-25. Smith, Lack. Interesting. Yeah, I'm going to go more 60-30. I think, I think as long as Smith well, stays healthy. That's like 90 games. Oh, you're right. Okay. 60-20. Um, there you go, 60-20. I think... Maybe I should have put Lack in my struggle for the season. I think that Lack is a guy who is going to try to be a starter again. I mean, we saw great things from him in Vancouver, and I want to think that he's going to be able to rebound to that. But I worry that what we saw from him in Carolina is going to carry over. And I don't know that he... I think the Flames want him to earn the job from Smith, but I don't know he's ready for that yet. Yeah. We'll and see. I think as a transitional piece, there's not a lot of future here. I think he's just keeping the bench warm until Gillies comes. And I think, and honestly might... for me, I think if lack has a 500 season, I think he, he is an overwhelming success. So as long as he does an adequate job, that's perfectly fine. Good point. Um, on that, do you think Smith will, pro- will finally provide the goaltending we've need? We need, I think for the yes. last couple of years, we've both said that goaltending's really been one of the Achilles heels here. Yeah, I do. I think that the Flames are not Arizona. And Smith has only played in front of a decent team once. And that one time, they went to the conference finals. And the Flames are by far the best team that he's played for. And because you just look at the rosters that the Coyotes put up and give me a break. Um, So I, I think that... It's one of those things where each goes hand in hand. Like, Smith does struggle, but I think that the team can take the load off of him and he can take some of the load off of the team because of his passing abilities. It's a good way to say it. So I think it'll be a symbiotic benefit for both sides of the coin. And, like, especially at, at, like if the games go to overtime at all, I think the Flames are basically instant winners in each of the games because of the fact that, like, unless you win the, like, you're the opponent, unless you score a goal off of winning the faceoff, you're done. And because the Flames can control the puck and control the puck and control the puck, and we all saw how well they were able to Swiss cheese other teams last year. But if the Flames get tired at all, they can just flip the puck back to Smith. And Smith can just, as they're going for the line change, pick the new guy coming off the bench and flip the puck to the other blue line, and there you go again. And because Smith's such a good passer, it basically makes the Flames invincible in the po- in overtime during the regular season. My thought on it is I don't think we found, say, the next Mika Kiprasov. He's oh, no, 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 no. games on his own. But I don't think that he's a liability like we've seen in the past. I don't think we're going to lose games that the rest of the team has played fantastic, but the goalie's just been our downfall. I think Smith is an adequate enough goalie for the defense we have. And I think, you know what, do I think he's going to be a Stanley Cup goaltender for us this year? No. But I think he's good enough that, you know what, he can he can he can help the team win games he's not going to cost us as many games we might have seen and it's yet. one of those things that if the flames are in a spot where they are vying for the cup he could do enough where we do win and it won't be co- be because of him specifically but he won't cost us because of bad goaltending yeah it's a good way to say it. we're not going to win a cup because of this goalie but i think he's going to be more solid than we saw from Elliot last year in the playoffs yeah I agree. Matt, who do you think uh, first call-up is forward and defense? I'm going to subtract Jankowski because that's, again, too obvious. And I'm going to go with Emil Poirier up front. I think that he, he'll be the first guy up. Um, and I think on defense, I'll go with Anderson just because, and it's a coin toss. It'll be Anderson or Shillington, depending on which defenseman gets hurt. I was thinking Poirier, and I was going to say Poirier, but I think 
you know what? I'm going to give it to, Sh- to Shin Carrick. I think Shin Carrick and, and, and Poirier are both guys that the Flames need to see something from this year. And I can see them both getting a call up at some point. I think yeah, Shin I Carrick... think the reason why, like, Spencer Fu would obviously be the more obvious choice. But because of the fact that you don't need to rush him and he needs to learn, you can just park him at. Whereas the other guys, like, they're getting to the end of their rope. You need to see something from them. So that's why I think those guys would be more yeah, likely. And, and, and I don't want to say these guys are expendable, but let's just say if Fu gets hurt in an NHL call up, Stockton's going to suffer. I think if Shin Carrick were to stay here for a while or get hurt, say, in the NHL, Stockton's not going to suffer as much from it. And I think that the Flames want to put out a competitive Stockton team. So you always look at that as well. Yeah. And I'll agree with you on the defensive side. I think Anderson comes up first. Yeah. Um, who do you think? F- we get this wrong every year. So maybe pick the guy you don't think it's going to be, and maybe he'll get traded first. Who's the first guy you think gets dealt from the Flames? I'd ha- Well. Th- this is a tough one this year. Uh, yeah. The two obvious players are Troy Brower and Brett Kulak. And I'll go with Brower. See, I want it to be Brower, but I just I don't know if we're gonna find a buyer. Yeah. I'm gonna go with Brower and I was originally thinking Brower and Hamilton, but I don't think they're gonna trade Freddie just because his brother's here. But you know what? I I just don't see a lot of movement in this lineup. I think if you look at expendable pieces, it's Brower. Yeah. I like think you're not that trading the, Goudreau, I, Monahan, or Furlan. You're not trading the three M line. Versteeg's not going anywhere. Maybe Lazar. Honestly, I think that, like, if anything, the Flames will add at the deadline. And, like, if any trades happen, it'll be in the draft, like, towards then. See, I can see them add, subtracting to add. Like, I can see them moving Brower out to be able to bring somebody in. Yeah. We'll see. It, I, yeah, I'd, I'd be more likely to say that nobody will be traded this year than a guy getting traded off the roster. I don't know. I I have a feeling Stajan gets traded at the deadline, but I don't think that'll be the first move. Yeah, I don't even see him getting traded. So, yeah, it's one of those. He could go either way. All right, next question. This one's maybe a little more long-winded. What do you think the Flames have to do if you can narrow it down to one thing to be successful this year? At a minimum, win at least a round in the playoffs. And honestly... I expect them to be one of the final four teams and possibly the best team in the West. So I'm hoping that they win the Stanley Cup, frankly. I think that... Isn't that success- what everybody wins every year? I don't think we've ever heard somebody says, you know, I really don't want my team to win it this year. Yeah, well, I think that the Flames' expectations are is to be in that conversation. We have and to. With what we've given up, we better be. Yeah, and realistically, the team... Like, if you're looking for serious contenders, like, there's not really that many in the West. Like, Anaheim's not, they're a year older. They're not getting any better. I think Anaheim's going to be big on defense this year. They yeah. Some nice defensemen. Yeah. And you got, like, Chicago's weaker. I think Dallas is going to surprise people in the West. Dallas will be better, but I don't think they're very much a threat like there's not really a lot of good teams in the west so like really it's just calgary and edmonton that i wouldn't i don't could they don't have depth so like they might be able to win some games but i don't see i guess calgary edmonton and yeah that's about it like i don't consider nashville a threat either so just Calgary and Edmonton, basically, for the West. And Pittsburgh and... So you think just winning around in the playoffs and... Well, that's why I want the... And once they've won that round, you think they're off to the I races? I think that the Flames need to win the division this year, just so that way they get an easier first round. Because, like, they... It would be a lot easier if they're playing, like, an L.A. or a Nashville or a Chicago in the first round versus... Edmonton or Anaheim and let those two teams beat the hell out of each other and then you know pick up the scraps in round two so I had three things on my list here I also had win the division I think if we can win the division 
I don't want to, you know, knock on wood when I say this, but I think if we win the division, we pretty much clinched a Western Finals. Birth. Yeah, I agree. I also, I, I also have goaltending down. I think one of the things that's been the Achilles heel last couple of years is goaltending, and if we don't get the quality of goaltending that we'd expect from a, you know, Western Western Finals team, this whole thing could fall apart. And so I really think Smith and Lack have to step up and give us that goaltending we need or we're not going to get to where we need to be. I don't think this team can be good in spite of their goalies. And we saw that last year. And I also went at the Honda Center. I think setting things up yeah, in the sure. right vein is going to be, you know what, let's get that win. Let's show that we can do this. And then that monkey's off our back and we can do anything. Yeah, I think that is a pivotal thing. They need to win in Anaheim at some point this season. Hopefully they get it all right off the bat. And we have a chance, what, in the first yeah, two weeks? Yeah, it's the third game of the season. So, like, get it out of the way early. Get that storyline done, finished, and let's carry on. And, you know, go beat up everybody. <laughs> what would you think if Yager was the one to score the game winner in Anaheim? Hey, I don't care who the hell does it. If Tanner Glass does it, I'll be jumping up for joy. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Just beat them. Do you, do you name the new arena after whoever does it? <laughs> the Tanner Glass Scotiabank Arena. Sure, why not? Our hero, who Arth beat yes. the Ducks. Sure, why not? Um, last question for you. A lot of a lot of pundits this year think that the Edmonton Oilers might be the team to skate away with the Stanley Cup. What do you think? It is all one hundred percent marketing, uh, because you got to figure that. Like when you saw Sidney Crosby win the cup with the first time with Pittsburgh, the team was deep and there was a lot of good players in Pittsburgh when they won the cup. And the first time they went to the finals, they had a lot of talent on that team. When you saw Chicago win, they were deep throughout their lineup. All the forwards, all the defensemen were good. You look at, like, every team that's won the Cup, the whole team has been good. Edmonton, outside of McDavid, Dreisaitl, Lucic, maybe Puliu-Yarvi, and I guess Clefbaum on defense, like, there's just not enough there there. And they're good enough, they'll probably win the first round uh, i but they could if they play anaheim in the first round i could see anaheim beating them again like they're not that good and they lost everly and they replaced them with somebody who kind of sucks frankly yeah so strong but same thing they yeah. lost hall and i don't know i don't see them i i think it's hype mostly like at least like with Crosby he had a team around him and I don't see Edmonton having the depth to do so and like Edmonton kind of reminds me of the post-cup Chicago Blackhawks where they have a couple of good pieces but nothing else to actually make them do anything and I don't see like they're they should be a playoff team or in the ballpark. I just don't see them being a threat once they get there because all a team has to do is target Dreisaitl and McDavid and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And that's it. For the sake of the Battle of Alberta, I'm happy that the Oilers are on oh, the yeah. upswing. I think it's fun to play them. It's fun to have a good team there. It's not fun when they beat us 7-2, and two, but I think that, that is, that's a good thing for us as Flames fans. I agree with you, though. This is not a team that wins a Stanley Cup. It's not deep enough. It's fun to think that, oh, yeah, you know, McDavid, he gets a cup, but I, the, this uh, to me, there's almost this you earn the cup by, you know, building that team slowly. And, yeah, they've got some great pieces, but they haven't finished their rebuild yet. And I think they're going to see teams like Calgary who are deep enough. I mean, we've talked about the depth all show today who will be able to outwork them because of that. Yeah. And that's the thing. The good teams that win the cup, it's not like we've seen 
teams, like when Joe Thornton was like the best guy in the NHL, did they win the cup? No. Because those teams didn't have enough around them. And you look at like Aginla when he was the best player in the NHL. Did we win? No, because we didn't have enough around him. And McDavid is legitimately the best player in the league. But they don't have enough of anything else. And the teams that were successful last year were the deepest teams in the league. And the lo- the final four teams actually were the four four of the deepest teams in the entire league. And that's why they got to where they were. Because not only did they have skill, but they had the depth through the lineup. And all the top-heavy teams, like Chicago, bounced in round one. Edmonton, bounced in round two. San Jose, bounced in round one. Us, because uh, we were a little top-heavy, bounced in round one. And it's one of those things that you need multiple lines that can roll, especially in the playoffs. Because that's how you get the momentum going. And... Like, yeah, McDavid might score a goal or two in a game, but you also need the Troy Browers and the whatever else to contribute. And each game can be decided by a single goal. And if you only got one guy that's chipping in, you know, that's not a recipe for success. At least not in a seven-game series. Uh, you can win a game because McDavid goes and does his thing and scores a hat trick. But I think Edmonton will be a contender within the next handful of years. But I just don't think they're there yet. The cap is going to prevent them from doing so. I think they're completely handcuffed by all the stupid contracts they have. I don't. I, I don't, don't ever see them doing anything. The Lucic contract is horrendously bad. The Russell contract is worse. And they just have too much cap. It's like us last year where we had like $20 million tied up in marginal players. The Oilers have that much tied up in marginal players. And you just can't succeed if you have too many dollars tied up in mediocrity. And you just can't replace those players with quality and they don't have a deep farm system where they can just, okay, this guy sucks, we can just stick random high-end prospect in. Like, they don't have a Jankowski. Which, when you think about it, is kind of surprising. For as bad as they've been, for as long as they've been, that they really don't have the quality of prospect to, you know, jump into those roles. I know. Well, a bad team. Like, if honestly, if it wasn't for McDavid, they probably would have had a top five pick last year again. And... <laughs> Each year, they would have had a top five pick. Like They're a bad team. Like If they didn't have McDavid, they would be a top five pick this year. Well, let's finish our Oilers talk. That's not what we're here for, but I guess both of us are answering that question with a nope. They're not going to win the Cup this year. No. I'd be shocked. And me- I would be absolutely shocked if they won the Cup at any point in the next 10 years. If they win the cup this year, I think there's a lot of GMs that are going to be sitting back going, what the heck happened? Yeah. It, I think that like they'd have to fluke out like Carolina did that one year when they won the cup. <laughs> where like it just kind of everything broke their way where like all the teams got hurt along the way <laughs> that they were playing. Can we unleash some sort of a virus in everybody's dressing rooms that we win? Well, I think that'd be the only way that the Oilers do. So, yeah, I don't see it. Well, Matt, let's wrap this one up. I want to let people know we're trying something new this year. We're going to try and have a poll every week, some sort of question that uh, people can give us their feedback on on the website. So if you go to our Twitter page, we're at Fireside Podcast. If you check us out on Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat, or go to our website at firesidechat.ca. You'll see right on the homepage, you'll see a poll of the week. And this week's question is, what are your thoughts on the Yager signing? I want to know what everyone's thoughts are. And um, is do you think it's a good depth signing? Do you think the Flames have found their new right winger? There has to be somebody better in the organization. Are you neutral about it? Or, hey, if we're signing old guys, why Yager over, y- over Iggy? So vote on one of those. And next week, we'll talk about what everyone thinks of this poll. So you can answer it either on Twitter, Facebook, or on the website. Matt, do you have a vote for one of those? Well, I'm just glad that they signed Yager. 
Uh, that I think it's a good opinion. depth signing. Yeah. And as for Yager versus Aginla, well, which would you rather have, Gaudreau or versus Stieg? You know, one's clearly better than the other. So I just think for a lot of people, there's that nostalgia of Jerome again. Yeah, and give me the better player, please. Thank you. I agree with you. All right, well, let's wrap this up. We've got three games coming up this week, and we'll talk after those. We have the Calgary Flames opening the season in Edmonton. Then the home opener on Saturday against Winnipeg. There's still tickets available. If you want to go to one of those games, check out our friends at Tick Ticks or um, wherever you buy your tickets. But there's still some good, good seats available. Don't miss that. And then the dreaded game at Anaheim on Monday. And we'll see if the Flames can break the Honda Center curse before we talk to you guys again. Yeah, well, if they ever yeah. want to consider themselves serious contenders for the Cup, they got to break that curse because, you know, get any stupidity out of the way. If we come back next week and the curse is broken, are you calling the cup right now? I will. <laughs> All right. Matt's going to make a little cup out of tinfoil and dishes, and he can parade it around for us. Oh, goody. A project. Yay. Now, you, now you're probably thinking, please lose Nanheim. I don't want to do this. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> All right, Matt. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.